Okay, so this is a, a rather different sort of talk. I'll just be giving some examples of what we can do with inductive logic programming type systems. It's a bit more of a fun talk. Um, so neural networks are amazing machines, but they have some issues to do with how much training data they need. So a neural network often needs huge amounts of training data before it can learn. They, it's often hard to inject prior knowledge into them. And often, the thing that they've learned is not interpretable. All you've got at the end is this massive tensor of floating point numbers. We don't understand what it means. Now, there are very smart people working on all these issues, but the issues are there. Some of the nice features of inductive logic programming systems are that they only need a small amount of data. It's very easy to inject prior knowledge, and we can understand and read what they've learned. So what I'm going to do today is show you a couple of applications of ILP which really try to illustrate these particular advantages. Okay, so I'm going to have to switch around a little bit because I have different... different things, sorry. Okay, so the first application um, I want to show you guys is called sequence. So sequence is a induction task introduced by Douglas Hostatter in his book Fluid Concepts and Liquid Analogies. In this task, the player or machine, whatever, is, is given some sequence of symbols and just has to guess the next symbol. So the only background knowledge is, is what we all know about the, the letters, the success relation on letters, that B comes after A and C comes after B, and so on. And to simplify things, like in um, the C test, we'll, we'll make the, the alphabet cyclic, okay? So after Z comes A again. So we have, so all we have is these 26 symbols with a cyclic success relation, and that's all the background knowledge we have. And now the task is, given some sequence, carry on with that carry on with that sequence. Okay, so here are some examples, uh, starting with some nice simple examples. So, the, now this is one way of continuing these series which seems natural to most of us. So, for example, on the fourth one down, we've got one A, then two Bs, and three Cs, and then four Ds. Um, now here we've got one A, and then five Ks, and then a B, and then four Ks, and a C, and then three Ks, and a D, and then two Ks. And then we'd get an E and then one K, but then because the um, alphabet is cyclic, we'll have, then have an F and 26 Ks. Well, that's one way of interpreting it. This one here is what Doug Hostetter called the theme song of the sequence project, because he was particularly obsessed with this one example. And the reason is because it's very easy for your eye to be misled by this big bunch of Bs in the middle. Yeah, so it's sort of like a sort of perceptual mirage. It's very easy for our eyes to be drawn to that big cluster of bees and think there's something very bee-ish going on here. Whereas what he wanted us to do was see it as a triple. B, A, B, 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 C, B, B, D, B, B, E, B, B, F, B. Okay. Now, of course, as we all know there are always many ways to continue a series. So consider the highly ambiguous series 1A, 2Bs, 2Cs. That could be a series that goes 1A, then 2Bs, then 3Cs. Or it could be a sequence of pairs, A, B, B, C, C, D. Or it could be going down again, or it could be some, some arbitrary. So obviously, there's an infinite number of possible programs that explain this data. But I think we'll all agree that some of these continuations of series are more natural than others. And I'll try and show you a concrete quantitative way in which we can analyze how some of them are more natural than others. Okay, so the first application of ILP is this system that um, learns to predict the next elements in these series, but it does more than just learn to predict it. It also generates a sort of parse, a sort of an interpretation of what's going on, and it also generates a program in order to explain what's going on. So what it's done here, this is, is it's constructed these objects and these moments in time and it's constructed a logic program which explains how these objects change over time. And in so doing, as a side effect of this, it also can predict the next elements. <coughs> so 
so here's an example. We've got A and then 5Ks and then B and then 4Ks. And what, what it does here, this uh, ILP system, is it constructs two objects. There's a top object and, and a bottom object. And it constructs different moments in time. And it gives these objects attributes which change over time. And it, and it has these assignments explaining how the input it's given uh, map onto properties of the objects. So we've constructed objects, moments in time, attributes of objects. The attributes change over time. And then we also construct a logic program that explains how these objects change over time. So that's what it is to parse this sequence, is to do all this stuff. So this model is inspired by broadly, and broadly Kantian constraints, that whenever we have any perceptual input, we are forced to uh, group it into moments in time. We're forced to see it in terms of objects that persist over time. We're, and whenever these objects have attributes that change over time, we're forced to construct rules which explain how the objects change over time. So according to this model, perception is rule induction. We're searching for a set of rules that satisfy these broadly Kantian constraints. Okay, so this is what Doug Hofstadter called the theme song of the sequence project. With this sort of perceptual mirage of a big cluster of bees in it. And, and this is the way that the system parses it. So it constructs three objects that change over time. And for each object, it comes with a cluster of logic programs that it has learnt. This feels to me like a nice satisfying way of understanding what's going on in these sequences. So this is not just ILP, right? It's, this is ILP together with a large set of priors about how to interpret the world by constructing objects with attributes, chunking things into moments in time, having one dimensional spatial relationship between these objects and so on. So this is ILP embedded in a larger system that's trying to make sense of the world. So this is an example that Doug Hofstadter was also obsessed with. It's, he called it the hemiolic bicycle. And all it is is three Bs, two Cs, three Bs, two Cs, three Bs, two Cs. And one way we can parse this is just two objects that don't change at all over repeated moments in time, right? This is one way of parsing it. And that's OK. But, but Doug Hostetter claimed that it was unsatisfying, this interpretation. And the interpretation that he preferred is this one, where we have one object changing over time. So this object has, has two properties, two attributes, A1 and A2. One of the attributes indicates what the mark is, what letter is used. The other property indicates how many marks there are for the object. And then those two um, attributes flip every moment in time. So this parsing, which seems deeper, which captures the sort of essence of the sequence, according to Doug Ostatter, is assigned, assigned a stronger a posteriori probability, according to my model, because it has a you know, smaller description length. OK, so this is trying to understand, trying to predict sequences. <coughs> by trying to understand sequences, where trying to understand sequences means um, constructing these objects, moments of time, attributes, and these logic programs, which explain how these objects change. OK, so the, the group from uh, Doug's lab that tried to solve this weren't able to solve a lot of the harder problems in their test set. Whereas our program that uses ILP plus these broadly Kantian constraints, is able to get significantly higher mark on these test sets. So here are some standard sequences. Here is what Doug says, you know, the preferred answer is. And then on the right is our system in maximum a posteriori mode, where we, we're taking the maximum 
uh, stereo probability as the right way to do it. Here are some more examples. On some of ours, uh, we couldn't find it in the time. You know, I, I imposed a limit of a certain number of hours. To so it's searching through the space of programs using an iterative deepening method. And I have some cutoff of a certain number of hours running, and some of them it just couldn't find in time. So after I got this working on, the, on Hostetter's um, sequences, I found that there were a number of other very similar tests in the literature, in psychology literatures. For example, the C test from Hernandez Orallo. And out of the box, this system was able to get almost all of them right, which, which reassured me that this was a general system for understanding sequence induction, rather than something that had been, you know, accidentally sub, um, subconsciously tuned to a particular data set, which is always a danger in these machine learning systems that you just sort of accidentally, you know, overfitted <coughs> to was this is an entirely new set that, that had not been anticipated when we designed the system, and it, straight out of the box, it was able to do it. Okay, so the other thing we did, so that was in maximum a posteriorum mode, where we're just looking for one particular answer. But that isn't always enough. So take, for example, a highly ambiguous sequence, like A, B, B, C, C. So I claim there are two obvious ways of reading that. One is, is one A followed by two Bs followed by three Ds, and another is it A, B, B, C, C, D. So then I did a very scientific experiment where I asked um, various, you know, humans what they thought the next answer was. And, but it wasn't very scientific. I just asked, you know, friends and family, like 20 people or whatever. And, and the blue answers is what their distribution of answers was, the, the blue graphs. But then I took my model in mixture mode. So we look at all the different parses and their probabilities. And what is interesting is that the distribution of probability of our system in mixture mode mirrors pretty closely my scientific sample of humans. So uh, my claim is this shows there's something about this as a, a sort of natural way to capture the, not just the peaks, but the distribution of answers that we think is acceptable. Okay, so there are a couple of other people who tried to do similar things to this, including um, uh, Uta Schmidt and others. But they used um, a, a program synthesis system called Eigel, which you guys might know, and they apply that to number series induction problems. The main difference, and what, what's similar about them, is we're both looking for general purpose solutions rather than focusing on this specific domain. But the, the real crucial difference here is we're injecting a ton of extra priors to do with forcing it to s interpret the world in terms of these objects changing over time according to um, rules which it has to induce. And these extra Kant-inspired priors are what enables it to work in this particular domain. So that's the main difference. So again, this is one of the main advantages, really, of ILP systems, is that if you have some theory that you want to impose, you can inject it directly into the ILP system in a way that is not so easy to see how to do with um, neural methods. Please, Henrik. Small, so if I would like to have something bigger, yeah, yeah. like a yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really, really good idea. So, her, her, um, uh, Hernandez Orallo has a similar thing for generating <coughs> an infinite number of examples from his C test, but his C test uses a very simple sort of underlying automata to generate these sequences. It would be great to use this to do that. Thank you, that's a great suggestion. Okay, so the key idea of my approach is to reinterpret some of Kant's principles as a set of domain-independent priors on a rule induction system. So these priors are not specific to a particular domain. That the idea is they'd apply to any kind of perception task, and they're the only priors that we use. Okay, so that was the first bit of my talk. The second bit is, is another example, which is perhaps a bit, um, well, it's different. Okay. 
Okay, so this is about learning social practices. So um, if, imagine you're a child and you're watching some adults performing various social practices, you'll be able to learn the practice from just a handful of traces of behavior. This is what children do all the time. They, they are watching competent adults socializing together and they pick up what the rules of the games are. How are they able to do this? So I'm going to show you an ILP system which is able to learn social practices from traces of behavior. So this is an example of apprenticeship learning, right? So we're learning by watching human authored traces of behavior. We're assuming those traces are in some way optimal or com competent. And in this particular case, we're gonna learn a social practice by watching traces of multi-agent behavior. Okay, so what does that mean? I'm gonna show you some examples now of my little videos. Try and make them big. <coughs> right, so the guy at the top is saying, hey, everybody point, pointed across, and they all pointed across. Hey, everybody stand next to some red object. So some of the graphics are not very good as I do them myself. Everybody pointed at some green object. Hey, Ludwig, he's pointing on a specific guy. Say the name of a hexagon. He happens to know the names. These are just examples of the kind of traces of behavior. Hey, Ludwig, he's the yellow guy. Point at some star. He points at a star. Hey, everybody, stand next to some triangle. Point, everybody point at some object that's not red. Hey, everybody, say your own name. So now they've all got different names, so they would say their own names. Hey, everybody, point out that object. So he's ostending to it, and he wants them to ostend to it. Hey, everybody except Ludwig, stand next to something that's red. So imagine that you're a child. These are competent adults performing these practices, and you're a child and you're trying to learn these practices from a handful of examples of traces of behavior. It's gonna give you... Okay, so Turing, in his famous paper where he introduced the Turing test, recommended apprenticeship learning over reinforcement learning as a way of learning language. So he said that um, basically, if we were to teach a child language by reinforcement learning, the child would be very sore indeed. If we, you know, if we gave him a whack, whatever, not that we would, every time, um, every time he got it wrong. Like, that would be a terrible way to teach children language, right? In fact, what Turing recommended in his seminal paper was apprenticeship learning, which is exactly this kind of thing, right? Which is learning from traces of optimal behavior. Okay. So why is data efficiency so important? People have shown that um, a child can learn a new word from just one instance. So the famous example was chromium. So I, I point at some object and say, well, this is chromium. Now, can you touch some chromium object? Everyone immediately realizes what chromium means from just one example. The other reason why data efficiency is so important is if we're going to generate human traces of behavior, they're very expensive to get the humans to do this. So we really want a system which can learn from a handful of traces, unlike some neural systems which need, you know, thousands of examples before they can learn effectively. Okay, so the system called Noob applies apprenticeship learning to language games and is very data efficient and it exhibits one-shot learning, zero-shot learning and transfer learning. So I will describe this system as an ILP system and try and uh, indicate how it's so data efficient. Okay, so a concrete example, the name game. So, so th this is the simplest possible game. These games are inspired by the um, language games and the investigations, right? These are the sim the first examples I'm going to show you are the simplest possible examples. So the red guy points at something and then says, what's its name? And everyone else shouts out what its name is. 
you, was you just saying like four examples of this, right? So the red guy points at something and says, what's its name? And everyone else shouts out what its name is. Right? You see a few examples of this. And what you want to be able to do is learn what the practice is. And this is what the ILP system generates. So it, it generates a logic program which captures this simple social practice. I'll go into some detail about how it works, but effectively what it's saying here is, the top clause is saying, hey, if the agent one says the word name, as in, I want to know what this name is, and is facing a particular object, then all the servant people should name the object. And the second clause says what it is to count as naming an object, which is to say some word which denotes that object. And then the orc's name is an invented predicate which is the denotation relation. So what's perhaps surprising about this system right, is we're learning a social practice as a set of explicit rules. Now, when we learn social practices, we are often unable to precisely articulate what the rules of the practices are. We may be able to fit in into all these different practices, but we're not able to say exactly what, what fitting in amounts to. As Dreyfus has emphasized many times, we have procedural know-how rather than declarative know-that when it comes to these social practices. But we want our computer agents, right, to learn explicit, readable models of social practices modeled as a logic program. Like this. We want them to learn explicit models of what the social practice is. Okay, so how, how does it do this? So the underlying theory of multi-agent behavior is based on a very general notion of a social practice as any multi-agent behavior with some common purpose. Some of these social practices, right, are instantaneous, like a greeting. Some of them might last half an hour, like a game. Some of them might last most of your lifetime, like a marriage. And some of them will outlive any one of us, like the British legal system. Why is that? <laughs> so the claim... I see. <laughs> so the claim is that the social world is a collection of concurrent social practices where, we're, where we are in many social practices concurrently. So for example, right now we're in many social practices concurrently. Supposing someone next to you whispers something to you, then you are currently in many processes at once. So we're in a, a pra one practice of you guys having been forced to listen to me, but you're also in another practice where you're responding to your friend. And so the claim is that the affordances you have are the union of the affordances from all the different practices that you're in simultaneously. So that's the multi-agent model that we are using. And this set of practices is evolving as we learn. So we learn new practices as we're going along and add them to our big pool. So now a, a language game, the sort of games we get in the investigations, is a subtype of social practice. So if we can have a general system that can learn social practices, we'll have a system that can learn and understand language from grounded examples. So now we model these social practices as a normative system containing two types of uh, clause. One is a normative clause describing what the agent should do, and the other is a descriptive clause saying what kind of actions count as what kind of actions. So concrete example is greetings. So a greeting has a normative component and a descriptive component. The normative component, telling you what you should do, says, well, if you see someone you haven't seen them for ages, you should greet them. That's the normative component. Then the descriptive component tells you what kind of actions count as satisfying that norm. So for example, doffing your hat counts as greeting. Saying hello counts as greeting. Waving counts as greeting. Fiddling with your phone doesn't count as greeting. So the claim is that a social practice can be modeled as a set of pairs of normative and descriptive clauses. Another example, conversation. So a, a simple direct yes, no question can be modeled as a, a pair of normative and descriptive clauses, right? So the normative claim is, <coughs> if someone asks you a direct yes, no question, you should respond. Of course, people don't always respond, but they should respond. If you don't know that normative clause, you don't understand what a direct question is. But then there's also what counts as satisfying that norm, which is saying yes or saying no. Okay, so now we represent these normative systems by a set of rules 
in a multimodal logic, which is itself modeled as a logic program. So there are three main predicates using propositions reified as terms. The first one, the is predicate, just tells us what things are true at what different moments. <clears throat> so for example, is ETP says in a particular episode E at time T, P is true. The should predicate specifies the norms. In episode E at time T, agent A should make it the case that P is true. And then the will predicate models the decisions that the agents have made, which propositions he's decided to make true. So just in the same way like, you know, event calculus or situation calculus, right? The actual propositions are reified as terms. So they're the things in the, the P's. And now a normative system is a set of pairs of rules, a normative rule and a corresponding descriptive rule. So for example, here's a highly simplified greeting practice. So what it says is that if there are two agents and they are at adjacent squares, then they should greet each other. And then this second rule says what counts as satisfying that norm. So if you doff your hat, that counts as greeting them. Okay, now when, supposing we've got a set of bare is facts, a set of facts about the world, we can use our practice to derive a set of social facts. So if we have this highly simplified social practice, and we have the following set of ground atoms, just telling us about positions of, so Alice and Bob are, Two, two squares separate from each other, but then at time t2, they move to be next to each other. And then at time t3, Alice doffs, his, doffs her hat to Bob. So using this practice, if you apply this practice to this set of is claims, we derive a set of should claims and a further counts as claim. Just using, okay. So now a norm to make it the case that P, is that P is true at T is satisfied if the should claim is a consequence of the practice and the is claim is also a consequence of the practice. So now we can count the number of satisfied norms in the episode. And this is how we're gonna do our induction. This is how we're gonna learn practices. So this expression counts the number of should claims that are a consequence of the practice, such that there's a corresponding is claim. So a norm is satisfied if there's a should claim and a corresponding is claim. And we're counting how many of those satisfied norms there are. Okay, so how do we learn? How do we learn these practices from these handful of traces? So all we've got, right, is positive examples. We've got a few examples of humans um, behaving in various ways in this simple microdomain, we haven't got any negative examples. So what we do is we simply create random perturbations to our trajectories, right? We, let a, we have our original trajectories in black. We create random perturbations of them by letting agents perform randomly at different points in red. So we start with our original trajectories. We create perturbed variants of them. So now what we want to do is measure how well a social practice pi, i.e. a set of clauses, explains a set of episodes S. And the key idea here is that we count the number of episodes in which there are more norm satisfactions in those episodes than there are norm satisfactions in the perturbed variations. So we assume that if we randomly perturb the, the trajectory, we're going to satisfy less norms. So now the learning task, right, is to find a social practice that best explains these episodes. We're trying to find the practice pi that maximally explains this series of trajectories. Okay, so I'm not going to go for all the... Um, low-level details, but basically we, we've got a suite of episodes and we want to produce a logic program that explains those episodes. So this is a... Nathan.
you don't, so my question is, don't you need a negative example to restrict the practice to give you more? So, so, please tell me if this doesn't answer your question. So Nathan is asking, how can I get away with just positive examples? So what we do is, is we, we start off with our positive examples and then we randomly, we create new trajectories by randomly perturbing the agents by performing random actions at various points. And then we mark these red trajectories as perturbed variations. And then what we're trying to do, and this is, this is really the crucial thing, crucial line, we, we, so we're saying that how well a practice explains this set of episodes is how many episodes the, there are more norm satisfactions in the episode than in the perturbed variation. So basically the idea is if you randomly perturb an episode, there'll be, more, there'll be fewer norm satisfactions. Okay, so this is, we treat this as an ILP problem where we're maximizing this explanation score. So we do this using iterative deepening. So we have some sort of set of program templates, like the kind of thing that Metagor has. We have some way of specifying a range of possible logic clauses that we're considering, and we iteratively extend that set of clauses with a larger and larger template. And at each moment, we evaluate this as how well it explains the, um, the sequence we have and keep track of the best one. So we are considering an increasingly large... I mean, enormous space of possible logic programs to find the one that best explains the trajectories. So, yes, I should have said that. Yes, exactly. It, it, it uses answer set programming. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so once we've learned to practice, the agents then actually need to perform in the practice. So, we also have rules <coughs> indicating how these norms. Um, get translated into action. So the key idea is that agents are norm-following norm beasts. So they, try to, they decide to do what they should do. If they, if they know that they should do something, they will do it, as long as they can, as long as it's compatible with other things that they're doing. Okay, so I'll show you some examples. So this is the name example again. But now hopefully... <laughs> So we just point at someone, what's his name? And everyone else says what his name is. <coughs> point at someone, what's his name? Everyone says what his name is. And it's a very simple example. We'll get more exciting examples. So the program that it learns is this one. So I've, the first clause is the um, clause describing what... Hello? So is this example, is the name of every individual Yes, it's learning the names as part of it, exactly. It, in fact, in the next slide, yes. No, it, the names of the characters is not prior knowledge. That would trivialise the problem entirely. In fact, yes. The, thank you. But this is exactly the point I'm trying to make right now. So here, in the is clause, what we're saying is that you count as naming an object, right? If there exists some word which you say, such that this word has this relation to the object. And then what it also learns as part of the learning process, right, is the denotation relation between names and objects. So... The things on the right-hand side, the agent for, <coughs> excuse me, are, are the actual objects. And then these words, Emmanuel and Gottlob, whatever, these are the names. So it's actually learned as part of the process, the denotation relation between... Yeah, otherwise, it would, if we gave it that as input, it would trivialise, it would make the problem too easy. Absolutely. In fact, notice that from this tiny handful of examples, it hasn't learned the exact right denotation relation. It hasn't given quite enough examples. So it, it thinks that the word Ludwig actually refers to two different agents. And it doesn't even realise this. This is a, like a unique relation. So well, that just shows the problem with not giving it enough information. The crucial point I'm trying to make here is that as well as learning the clauses representing the norms, it learns invented predicates connecting the words to the world. Okay, so the next example is the standing next to example. We're going to get to slightly more interesting examples. So, so in this game, the red guy says the name of somebody, and then he says a type of object, and he's expecting the person who he refers to to go and stand next to some object of that type. So now he says, Ludwig, stand next to some star. So he goes and stands next to a star. 
Now he says, Ludwig, hey, go and stand next to some triangle. Now, the nice thing here is that the system, the system uses what it's learned from the previous learning. So it, it remembers the names of objects. Because ILP systems are so effective at transfer learning, it's, it's remembered the denotation of the names. So, and, and it's using that information to learn this slightly more complex game. So in this game, what we're saying is that an agent S should stand next to an object if this other guy said some word and then this word hmm. yes this word denoted this agent and then he says some extra word and that extra word denoted this type of object and now he's saying, and now this extra type of object, and this object is of this type. So he's saying you should stand next to all objects of the type that he says. And then this relate, and then this is what counts as standing next to it. So um, we tried this on a number of different types of um, social practices. So some of them are simple ones, like the name and the next, then they get increasingly interesting. I'll just show you the gaze one, for example. So this is like, I don't know if you know, hey, sorry. Yes. Um, there are multiple solutions that will meet, and in the real world, of course, there may be preference to how people get there. Yes. Is preference encoded in your examples? Do we deal with that? How do you encode the way that we meet the end goal? Well, that's a good question. So, um, <clears throat> so at the moment, there is nothing about preferences in there at all. So what we do is we specify a set of norms. So the agent realizes that it, for example, needs to go and stand next to this triangle. And then that, that um, the answer set programming, uh, which is used to do um, forward planning, fixed horizon search, will find, like you say, a number of different ways of getting there. And it has no way to prioritize them. The only preference in there at the moment is, that it pref is the agents prefer in a inaction over action. So there's a, there's a no op action which they like doing. And so there's, there's an implicit pr preference for the not, for basic laziness. So they don't, once they've satisfied something, just say arbitrary words and stuff like that. But, so if your training set shows multiple ways of doing the same thing, yeah. what then happens? It will learn to do, do all those ways and not prioritize them. Now, this is a very good point. There, there are very recently some um, ILP systems that learn preferences from traces of behavior. So I don't know if you know Mark Law's work at Imperial. So he's doing exactly stuff that answers the question you're talking about. Uh, and that is indeed an important um, direction to be going in. It would be great to be able to do preferences as well. I'm just focusing on learning norms, but thank you. Okay, so I don't know if you've been told this, but apparently if you go to a zoo and there's some large ape, it's very important not to stare at it because uh, apes have this idea about if you st out stare them, it undermines their sense of alpha superiority. So, and this is, oh, sorry, it's gone too slowly. This is learning the gaze aversion from examples, right? So the, the red guy is the alpha male, right? And he's staring at the other guys and they all avert their eyes because they're beta males. And you, you can imagine that you look at this a little bit as, um, and, you, and you learn the practice from the examples. So, so here it is. So now we're learning from those examples. Now this example is sufficiently simple that it, it learns it almost immediately. And it's learned that, you know, if you're facing an agent, then you should face away from it effectively. Okay, another, uh, so what I, oh no, let me show you some more examples first. So I'll, sh I'll show you the exists example.
So these are getting slightly more complex examples. So now the red guy is asking an existential question. Is it the case there exists some object satisfying some property? And again, right, we've learned, um, we've already learned colors from, from previous language games, right? None of this stuff is hard coded. It didn't, when this thing started, it didn't know what any of these words meant. It didn't know what green meant or red meant, whatever. But it's learned the, the colors language game and it's learned the types language game. So now it knows what the types of objects are and the colors of objects are. And now it has to learn a more complex game, which is answer, answering existential questions. So the red guy said, oh no, let me clear the next one. Is there a yellow star? And the guys go, yes. Is there a green star? Yes. Is there a red triangle? No. And from this handful of examples, well, it's, it's a bit more than that, but this is just the video of it, it can learn um, what the, how to, the general format of answering existential questions. Um, similarly, for universal questions, so are all stars green? No, because there's a yellow star. Are all triangles green? And so on. But one thing I want to stress is it's not just, I'm focusing a lot, right, on learning simple language games, but this is a general system for learning social practices. So here is the unclean game. So imagine a sort of simple primitive tribe of agents and one guy, the elder, marks some objects as unclean. And when he says, when he points at an object and says wibble, that means he's making it unclean. But of course, the Asians don't know when they start what these things mean. So he points to the star and says it's unclean. So the, so the guy gets away from it. He points to the yellow star. The guy moves away. He points to the triangle and says it's unclean. Right. Again, imagine you're just looking at these handful of behaviors and you have to learn a practice that, that explains these behaviors. So what we also did as a sanity check is ran other um, simple systems to try and predict which the episodes were the original episodes and which were the perturbed variants. And this is indeed a hard problem. And crucially, the, it isn't just enough to see this as a, hello. That's a really good question. Right, sorry, I should have said that. Thank you. Right, so the background knowledge is simply the physical facts about the world. So like the, um, the location of objects, um, f facts about their colors and types. So sorry, the background knowledge is represented as a set of ground atoms in an answer set program. It's, uh, I I'm not solving any perception problem here. They're not starting from raw pixels. They are starting from a set of ground atoms. But they don't know what any of the words mean or what any of the practices, what any things in any of the practices mean. Thank you. That, that's, that's one of the things they learn, yes. But they, they, don't, they don't start with that, yeah. That's right. Right, let me, uh, I'll just give you some other examples of the sort of range of things this system can do. So for example, um, this is a very British example. So all British people love queuing. It's what we do best. So. So this is the social practice queue. The idea is, that, again, these agents have a, a social um, status hierarchy, and they're always queuing up with the red guy who's the most high status at the top. What? <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have. I thought that's what the... So, so, forget about you saw the last example. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another example which I like, which is tidying up. So, so this is quite, basically this is a very expressive system for learning practice. And so in this practice, the idea is that tidying up, I know it's obviously a hugely simplified notion of tidying up, is putting objects of the same type next to each other. So again, you can imagine looking at a handful of examples of this and learning what it means to tidy up. Right. Um, 
I have tried it with a little bit of noise and it's okay, but I, I mean, I only tried it as a sanity check with a tiny amount of noise. I, I'm, I'm giving it a very small number of examples because these examples involve humans moving the things around. So uh, I haven't tried big industrial, it certainly works with a little bit of noise because it's just trying to find the program that maximizes this uh, numeric distance. So it, it is certainly robust to some noise, but uh, I haven't really pushed that. <coughs> but thank you. Yeah. So here's a few more examples. This is just asking questions. Just, just to show the flexibility of the system. It, it can, for example, they can understand um, indexicals and, uh, so if, for example, am I both red and a person? So there it has to understand indexicals. Hey, here it is understanding negation. So there are, so this is a system that is quite expressive in terms of the range of social practices it can do, even though it is so simple. So sorry, I've rather rushed through this and I've almost finished, so we get to go early for good behavior. But um, so this is the last bit of the um, talk. So what makes a system uh, so data efficient? So in general, data efficiency requires prior knowledge. But of course, if we inject domain-specific prior knowledge, we make our system parochial. So what you want to do is inject maximally general domain-independent prior knowledge. So, for example, a convolutional net, right, has this very general prior that objects are of the same type no matter where they appear on your visual field. And recurrent nets, right, articulate a very, very general prior knowledge that rules about the world don't change their truth values at different moments in time. And this system, which I just showed you, also has, a, has incorporates prior knowledge of what I claim is a general kind. So it's a very general model of social practices and practical reasoning encoded in modal logic. So we have this simple modal logic distinguishing between what is the case, what should be the case, what I've decided to make the case. We have these general axioms of practical reasoning relating these three um, predicates. And we have this very general template for what a social practice is. So the claim is that a social practice is just a set of pairs of should rules and corresponding is rules. And this general template is a strong language bias, which enables us to learn from such a small amount of data. And in particular, we, we also only consider a subtype of rule. So we, we have no constants when we're searching through the space of logic programs. We only consider rules with universally quantified variables. Things that make it easier for us is that we are given as input, right, a symbolic description of the world as a set of ground atoms. We're not learning from pixels. And we give the system as built-in knowledge, knowledge about um, the, f the physical actions and what they do. So for example, if I move left, the result will be that, if I do the action of moving left, the result will be that I, I go to the next square. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Um, that's, uh, yes? In this system? Uh, so, well, some of the predicates, like is, is, and should, right, they already have their arity, and the uh, invented predicates have a maximum arity of <laughs> two or three, I think. Hey. I'm, I'm sorry? Into the first system, into the sequence system. So, but there's a sort of... Uh, how much do you know about ASP? Basically, I encode the whole thing as an ASP program, and, and I have um, a counting of how many Kantian priors are violated. And uh, For example, one classic example is, it says in the analogies of experience, that if you've got some object with some attribute, and that attribute changes over time, then you must have a rule that explains how it changes over time. So you must have some in this case, clause, which explains how it changes over time. So I count violations of this stuff, and then we're trying to find the answer set that minimizes the number of violations. So it's, it's answer set programming in optimization mode to minimize a certain numerical quantity. another agent to then pass some knowledge on or to ask a question of another agent so like these very complex 
effects of things. Right. Yeah, that's a good question. No, so I, at the moment, I'm testing it on these relatively simple um, sort of reactive scenarios where one agent initiates a norm and then other agents satisfy a norm. There are more complex examples where one agent initiates a norm, someone else fails to satisfy it, and then he gets, for example, punished. And in principle, this system can do it, but I haven't tried it on those larger experiments, but that's a really good point. Thank you. How do you combine social norms? Like, you know, as part of the discussion, you will start by thinking, is there some mechanism in which, by learning the discussion practice, you first realize that there was the greeting and something else? Or do you, you know, can you combine this, uh, the, the norms that you learn? Sorry, Nath, I, I so just don't quite understand what you're saying. If you're having a discussion, it, it, you will start by greeting each other. Uh -huh. So uh, is there a way in which uh, you will learn to have a discussion by first recognizing there should be some greeting? Uh, right. You mean a practice which involves initiating other practices as components? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, I, I certainly haven't done any experiments like that, but I think it would be great to do that. <coughs> Thank you, that's a really good idea. Yes? Hello. Um, at the moment, everything you're doing seems to have your agents are identical, yes? Well, they have different properties, like their colours and stuff, and they have different names. Okay, but nothing in terms of their abilities or their knowledge. That's true. This is, th that's a very good point, yeah. There's nothing here about incomplete knowledge. It, it, imagine that, sorry, that you are the child watching these agents, and you're just trying to learn the practices from watching these agents, and you, and you the child, have complete knowledge. You're looking over, there's no, inc yes, that's right. So is there, do you feel the scope in this for having the idea of um, different capabilities across a net of agents that can be therefore solving problems collaboratively? You show tidying up. Right. That's a first step towards them working together. Right. Definitely, definitely. I mean, so the, the, for, the planning system that's used under the hood would certainly accommodate agents with different capacities, but I'm certainly not exploiting that. That's a good idea as further work. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So that's right. But in that case, it just wouldn't have, it wouldn't see it as necessary to have the master predicate in there. That's right. Because there's no distinction there. In many social practices, there's no status distinction whatsoever. It feels like so status distinctions are increasingly unfashionable. But as a British person, I still hold to them. You mean when it failed to learn them? Yeah. Um, like did, was there some intuitive reason that certain social norms failed? Right. Well, so, it's, so not, uh, it's, the question is about failure. But the thing it's failing to do is, is trying, failing to learn a practice. And, and so the way it's doing that under the hood is it's, it's searching through the space of logic programs with increasingly complex programs. And, but obviously this is a giant search problem and a lot of the practices we want to learn are outside the scope of what it finds within this small number of hours that we run this system for. And so when it fails to find, some, find the answer, it is, it is normally because of that. And I mean, the, two, the underlying technology which it's relying on, which is inductive logic programming, is still at a stage where we're not learning giant programs very, very quickly. So it, it, it would certainly benefit from all this stuff being scaled up significantly. Thank you. Thank you.